we next have the issue of Commonwealth versus Massachusetts versus Michelle Carter. So this is a pretty interesting case dealing with free speech issues and criminal law. So basically the, the question is, can you encourage someone to commit suicide? And is there a line somewhere where that crosses into criminal conduct? So wow, let's... this is a change in tone. It, it's a, I mean, just like... it's a slightly it's a slight Which... change in tone. We went from just... went from bitches <laughs> to a suicide. Okay, yeah. Okay, all right. Getting my mind it's slightly different. Suicide tone. is painless. It. it brings on many changes, and I could take or leave it as I please. Okay. Well, yeah, we're moving on to things. At the age of 17, Michelle Carter was charged with involuntary manslaughter as a youthful offender for the suicide death of Conroy Roy, Conrad Roy, age 18. We affirm uh, dismissal, concluding there's probable cause to show the coercive quality of defendant's verbal conduct overwhelmed whatever willpower the 18-year-old victim had to cope with for his depression, and that but for the defense admonishments, pressure, and instructions, the victim's the victim would not have gone back into his truck and poisoned himself to death. We now consider where the evidence at trial was sufficient to support the judge's finding of proof beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant committed involuntary manslaughter as a youthful offender and whether other legal issues raised or revisited by defense, including defendant's verbal conduct, was protected by the First Amendment, require reversal. We conclude the evidence was sufficient to support the finding of proof beyond a reasonable doubt and we find other legal issues, including First Amendment, lack of merit. On July the 13th, 2014, the victim's body was found in his truck, which was parked in a store parking lot in Fairhaven. He had committed suicide by inhaling carbon monoxide that was produced by a gasoline-powered water pump located in the truck. The defendant, who lived in Plainville, and the victim, who divided his time between the mother's home in Fairhaven and his father's home, First met in 2012 when they were both visiting relatives. Thereafter, they rarely saw each other in person, but they maintained a long-distance relationship by text message and phone. A frequent subject of their communications was the victim's frail mental health, including suicidal thoughts. Between October the 12th and July 2014, the victim attempted suicide several times by various means, including overdose on over-the-counter medicine, drowning, water poisoning, and suffocation. Now, these attempts were successful as the victim abandoned each attempt or sought rescue. At first, the defendant urged the victim to seek professional help. Indeed, as early as July 2014, the defendant, who was planning to go to McLean Hospital for treatment of an eating disorder, asked the victim to join her, stating that the professionals there could help them with his depression and they could mutually support each other. The victim rebuffed the efforts and the tenor of their communication changed. As the victim continued researching suicide methods and shared findings with the defendant, the defendant helped to plan how, where, and when he would do so and downplay his fears about how suicide would affect his family. She repeatedly chastised him for indecision. Do you want to read this with me? Do you want to play the role of defendant or victim in this wonderful uh, soliloquy uh, tactical, or would you just prefer me to do it by myself? Um... So I am having a little bit of an internet issue. So you're cutting a little bit in and out. Um, what page are you on? Five? I am on page five. Yes, I'm on footnotes. I'm on footnote three of page five. Okay, I guess I'll be defendant if you can hear me okay. Okay, yes, you can be defendant and I will be horror show that is victim. Go ahead and start. Well, well there's more ways to make CO. Google ways to make. OMG. What? Portable generator. That's it. That makes CO? Yeah. It's an internal combustion engine. Do you have one of those? There's one at work. And then let's skip, uh, okay. Skip to the bottom of the page. Which victim, I have a bad feeling. You are a victim. Oh, am I? I thought, yeah. I, okay, victim. I have because victim is boy, defendant is girl. Yes. Okay, fine. I have a bad feeling that this is going to create a lot of depression between my parents and sisters. I think your parents know you're in a really bad place. I'm not saying they want you to do it, but I honestly feel like they can accept it. They know there's nothing they can do. They've tried helping. Everyone's tried. But there's a point that comes where there, is, where there isn't anything anyone can do to save you, not even yourself. And you've hit that point. And I think your parents know you've hit that point. You said your mom saw a suicide thing on your computer and she didn't say anything. 
I think she knows it's on your mind and she's prepared for it. Uh, I don't know how much more of this I can read. Okay. God, that's so disgusting. <laughs> uh, do we really need to read the rest of this? No, we don't. I'm not here to okay. push for you. I'll tell you that's, what. I, I'm sorry. That's, unless, <laughs> unless, you, unless you object, I will read it. Do you object to me reading the whole thing? Um, you, you can. Uh, just let's let's give people um, a chance to brace themselves because it's this is bad. I'll take Those that as are, I'll take that yeah. as a no, and I'll just take it as there's a horror show. Let's just move on with our lives. How about that? Yeah. She repeatedly chastised him for the indecision and delay, texting, for example, that he better not be bullshitting me and saying you're going to do this and then purposely getting caught and made a promise to kill himself. The trial judge found the defendant's action from June the 20th, 30th to July the 12th constituted wanton or reckless conduct in serious disregard of well-being, but this behavior did not cause death. This and other evidence, however, informed and instructed the judge about the nature of the relationship and the defendant's understanding of the feels, feelings that he had with her, his ambiguities, fears, and concerns. I'm going to read this now. You just need to do it, Conrad, or I'm going to get you help. You can't keep doing this every day. Okay, I'm going to do it today. Do you promise? I promise, babe. I have to now. Like right now, where do I go? And you can't break a promise. And just go into a quiet parking lot or something. Good. Oh God, because that is very clear cut. Okay, so in in my non lawyer opinion, there's you know some actions. There there are some ways that you could phrase things, where you say you know what, no matter what happens, you know I'll always love you, and like if you end up committing suicide or whatever, know that that I'll love you after you die. Like you could say something like that, which would be a little bit borderline. Um, you could say something like, well, no one really understands what it's like to be suicidal. People don't understand um, that you can't just like wait it out or something. Like you could you could say sympathetic things that don't immediately sound like you're discouraging the person from doing it. But this is like, okay, you're promising to do it. Like, okay, you can't go back on a promise. Like, this is way not what normal, rational people do. No, it's not. I, I agree. Yeah. In the days leading to July the 12th, 2014, the victim continued planning his suicide, including by securing a water pump that he would use to generate the carbon monoxide in his closed truck. On July the 12th, the victim drove to the truck to a local parking lot and started the pump. While the pump was operating, filling a truck with carbon monoxide, the defendant and the victim were in contact by cell phone. Cell phone records show that one call over 40 minutes had been placed by the victim to defendant and a second call of similar length by the defendant to the victim, including a time when the police believed the victim was in the truck committing suicide. There's no contemporaneous record of what the defendant and victim said to each other during the call. The defendant, however, sent a text to a friend at 8.02 p.m. shortly after the second call. He just called me and like there was a loud nose like a mortar, motor, and I heard moaning like someone was in pain and I wouldn't answer when he said his name. I stayed on the phone for like 20 minutes and that's all I heard. He called me and I heard muffled sounds of some type of motor running and it was like that for 20 minutes and he wouldn't answer. I think he killed himself. Okay. Weeks later, she texted the first friend again, saying in part, I failed. I wasn't supposed to let that happen. Now I'm realizing I failed him. His death is all my fault. Like, honestly, I could have stopped him. I was on the phone with him when he got out of the car because it was working and he got scared and I fucking told him to get back in. Uh... Because I knew that he would do it all over again the next day. I couldn't have him live that way when he's living anymore. I couldn't do it. I wouldn't let him. So everyone, let's just uh, go. So if you believe that you have encountered someone who is in the process of trying to harm themselves like that, the correct answer is called 911 and give them that person's location. Just so we're all clear. That is the legal thing to do. Yeah. Call for help would be a viable option. Get back in the car is not exactly the, yeah. The judge found the victim got out of the truck seeking fresh air in similar ways to how he had abandoned his prior suicide attempts. 
The judge also focused his verdict as we, pre this was a bench trial, that's why he says his verdict. This was, the jury was waived because the defense thought that the jury might be inflamed by these facts and therefore might have a better chance at a judge trial. I think the defense probably calculated correctly. Yep. I'm really surprised that this went to trial instead of a plea. Okay, let's see. Judge found that when the defendant realized he'd gotten out charged, she instructed him to get back in, knowing it had become a toxic environment and knowing the fears, doubt, and fragile mental state. The victim followed the instruction. Thereafter, a defendant, knowing the victim was inside the truck and the water pump was operating, the judge noted she could hear the sound of the pump and the victim coughing, took no steps to save him. The judge concluded defendant's actions and her failure constitute each and all of wanton and reckless conduct that caused the victim's death. Yes, that's, that's pretty bad. Wanton. Yes. Yes. It's just like depra depraved would be another way for, for, for wanton. It's just. It's I say wanton. 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 Like, I, I, yeah, I put more of an I instead of the, the O because of wanton, I think of Chinese food. But wanton, I think of like one disregard. You know, it's possible like, that I've been pronouncing it wrong for years. I've always said wanton. And maybe it is wanton. I've, I, I, we can look at dictionary.com and see whether or not I've just been pronouncing it wrong all these years. But okay. I mean, there, there can be regional differences too. Maybe that's a Canadian thing. No, yours does sound better. So, yeah. Let's see if there's anything else we want to cover in this case. I want to cover the First Amendment issues. Let's see if the court separately does that. Oh, they talk about legal causation. We'll talk about that because it's an interesting issue. Although we recognize that legal causation in the context of a suicide is an incredibly complex inquiry, we conclude there's sufficient evidence to conclude a finding of proof in such causation beyond a reasonable doubt. The judge could have properly found, based on the evidence, that the vulnerably confused, mentally ill, 18-year-old victim had managed to save himself once in the midst of his latest suicide attempt, removing himself from the truck as it filled with carbon monoxide. But then, as a weakened state, he was badgered back into the gas-infused truck by the defendant, his girlfriend, and closest, if not only, confident in this suicidal planning, the person who had been constantly pressuring him to complete their off disgust plan, fulfill his promise to her, and finally commit suicide. And then after she convinced him to get back into the carbon monoxide filled truck, she did absolutely nothing to help. I just would like to state clearly for the record that any First Amendment issues I have with this trial does not in any way suggest that I think that this is a good person. Once again, legal and moral are completely different issues. So I'm not saying that this is a good person. I'm just interested in the legal issues. Let's see, okay, free speech claims. Defendant argues that her conviction of involuntary manslaughter violates her right to free speech. We disagree and affirm our conclusion in a prior case that no constitutional violation results from a conviction of a defendant of involuntary manslaughter for reckless and wanton Pressuring text messages and phone calls, preying upon well-known weaknesses, fears, anxieties, and promises, and finally overcame the willpower to live of the mentally ill, vulnerable, young person coercing the suicide. The crime of involuntary manslaughter prescribes, that is forbids, reckless or wanton conduct causing the death of another. The statute makes no reference to restricting or regulating speech, let alone speech of particular content or view. The crime is directed at a course of conduct rather than speech, and conduct it proscribes is not necessarily associated with speech. The defendant cannot escape liability just because she happened to use words to carry out the illegal act. Although numerous crimes can be committed verbally, they are intuitively and correctly understood not to raise First Amendment concerns. The same is true here. Okay. Yeah, because if you can, if you're not allowed to threaten murder, then I, I would put sort of that you know, true threat. Encouraging yeah. suicide in in this, the way that she did it and the words that she used and the fact that it was over a long period of time and she really convinced and conjoled him and that that I would put up in the same level, right? Just because he's, um, just because, uh, I, I don't know how to how quite say it. Um, when you threaten somebody else, um, they might not want to hear that. 
uh, just because she's saying words that he might want to hear or that he's open to hearing, I don't think that makes a difference. I think um, if you do something that causes death, <laughs> that uh, that's an issue. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. So you're when she's talking, she's talking about the true threats exception. So you obviously can't threaten someone. And that's a crime. And if they're what's considered true threats, that is an actual threat, then that's illegal. And it makes perfect sense. So it would make sense here that we're looking at something that is akin to that and could be uh, defended for its illegality on similar principles. Uh, you know, the only thing that sort of causes caution to my mind is I tend to be very extreme on the free speech issue. I don't go quite so far as calling myself a free speech absolutist, but, you know, freedom of speech is. A very important issue to me and so you know the, the, See, the balance the the issue here is is one that I have to spend more time thinking about because of that I, so the the elements that I see that that raises the the bar to manslaughter in this case would be um, the fact that that this is over time so that it's so it's not a one-off saying, you know, go kill yourself. It's not a stranger on Twitter commenting, you know, go kill yourself. This is a person in a position of trust. This is over a longer period of time. Um, there's also, when you when it comes to um, suicide, if you ever do uh, suicide intervention training, you, you can do a little mini risk assessment with someone when they're suicidal to determine how close they are to, to actually going through with it. And so um, one of the ways that you would do that would be like, okay, well, so you said that you want to hurt yourself. It's like, do you have a plan? Do you have access? So if they say like, oh, I would shoot myself and be like, okay, do you have access to a gun? And the more detailed the plan, like time, place, method, the greater the access to their method, um, that those are all higher risk. Like throw in more and more red flags. So in this case, she is, helping him find his plan and she is helping him find his methods and then she's on the phone with him as he's doing it and then when he abandons um the plan she tells him no go through with it basically i'm sick of you threatening to kill yourself every day you have to go through with it now and so that to me, these are all levels that are so much higher than a comment on YouTube. But this is so much this is so much higher than you know bullying from a stranger. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, it, we 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 had to skip a lot of the uh, soliloquy because the the texts are so horrendous over this period. But it's like it just goes on and on and on, and it's like yeah, there's a problem here. So. Yeah, it's, 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 I'm definitely, I'm, yeah, it's, it's atrocious. Let's, well, you know, go ahead. I mean, like, even if, so say I was a jerk to someone on Twitter and I said, oh, you should go kill yourself. And then the person tweeted an image of themselves with a gun and said, you know, like, okay, I guess tonight's my last night or something. Like, I would still be like, holy shit, I didn't mean it that way. Like, call 911. <laughs> like, there's, like, I, that's not what I, it's like, I wanted to express my displeasure with you. I didn't actually want you to harm yourself. Yeah. Um, so I think as soon as you have confirmation that the person is serious, that the person is in the middle of an attempt or anything like that, your human obligation to help someone identifiable in a situation of distress that overrides yeah. in my non-legal opinion fair enough yeah man tobin asked could they go reckless disregard and get murdered too um i i it's a reasonable question to ask but even if you can i think it would be an overcharge here i mean even the manslaughter i understand because she she one of the end results, but, um, you know, when you're thinking about, when you think about suicides or even like you normally are charging like some sort of manslaughter count, uh, rather than a murder count, but 
You raise a reasonable point. But I, I, as a prosecutor, if I were a prosecutor, I probably would bring this exact charge because you don't want to under, you don't want to overcharge. You know, you don't want to bring a charge that's too high, even if it falls within the line, because you're always worried about, you know, um, them not getting there. So you you have to make a strategic call. Um, whether or not you thought George Zimmerman actually did anything wrong, that was a criticism, for example, of the prosecution and George Zimmerman, that they, they charged um, Zimmerman with murder, uh, second degree murder, and the argument was that a lesser count would have been more likely to convict and it was an overcharge, even if he did something wrong. Um, but that's- I know, I'm assuming you can't charge both manslaughter and second degree. You can actually, it's a lesser included, but you still run into like, issues with you don't necessarily want to it's a strategic cause it's like do you want to make because then you're worried about compromise ver it's it's the whole calculation and you're also worried about like coming off too strong and them not coming off with anything it's 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 complicated so yeah you can charge the lesser included but it's a strategic cause so i don't know i don't necessarily fault the decision here but let's read on with the court's argument about the defendant thinking that they did nothing wrong and see how that went the defendant contends nonetheless that prosecuting and convicting her of involuntary manslaughter for encouraging suicide effected a content-based restriction on speech that does not withstand strict scrutiny. In particular, she acknowledges the Commonwealth's compelling interest in preserving human life, but argues that we failed to determine in a prior case that a restriction on speech was narrowly tailored to the interest. We disagree. The only speech made punishable in that case was speech integral to a course of criminal conduct, that is, a systematic campaign of coercion which was virtually present defendant embarked, capturing and preserved through text messages that targeted equivocally young victims' insecurities and acted to subvert their own willpower. Other involuntary manslaughter prosecutions and convictions have similarly targeted a course of criminal conduct undertaken through manipulative, wanton, or reckless speech directed at overpowering the will of lives of vulnerable victims. Uh, stuff, stuff, stuff. Let's see. The only verbal conduct punished as involuntary manslaughter has been wanton or reckless pressuring of a vulnerable person to commit suicide, overpowering that person's will to live, or resulting in the death. We are therefore not punishing words alone, as the defendant claims, but reckless or wanton words causing death. Speech at issues thus integral to the course of conduct and does not raise constitutional problems. Regardless, even if we were to apply strict scrutiny to the issue, it might implicate other constitutional protections regarding suicide or end of life, we would conclude restriction on speech here has been narrowly circumscribed to serve a compelling purpose. As explained and reemphasized, this case does not involve the prosecution of an end of life discussion between a doctor, family member, or a friend and a mature, terminally ill adult confronting a difficult personal choice that must be faced with a certain physical and mental suffering brought upon by the impending death. Nor does it involve prosecutions of general discussions about euthanasia or suicide targeting the ideas themselves. Nothing in our case or a decision today or our earlier case involving verbal conduct suggests involuntary manslaughter prosecutions could be brought in these very different contexts without raising important First Amendment concerns. We emphasize again, however, that the verbal conduct targeted here and in our past involuntary manslaughter cases is different in kind and not degree and raises no such concern. Only the wanton and reckless pressuring of a person to commit suicide that overpowers the person's will to live has been proscribed. This restriction is necessary to preserve the Commonwealth's compelling interest in life. Okay. Yeah, so strict scrutiny is the highest, let's see if, I, <laughs> let's see if I've been listening. Strict scrutiny is the highest level of scrutiny that, that you can put it. So the government has a really high burden to prove that the state's interest is, is super strong in order to um, override the First Amendment. And so they're saying that the state has a very narrow scope. They're not looking to, like, to stop all conversations about suicide or stop conversations about end of life decisions uh, in terms of terminally ill people. They're, they're specifically just saying if someone is really suicidal and then you egg them on and you undermine their will to live and you um, encourage them uh, over a long period of time to do this, then the, like that narrow situation um, is the only thing that's being uh, made illegal. And the reason why free speech doesn't apply is because the state has an overwhelming interest 
in people not dying. Yes. By their own hands, yeah. You've got it basically right. You're learning so many things. Yeah, so that is, that is the case of Commonwealth versus Michelle Carter.